in the book of Judges. We're in our uh, last message in this really difficult series called In Your Eye. At District Assembly this week, and several of you went with me, thank you for all you delegates and wonderful people who went to District Assembly with me. As I mentioned in my prayer time, we were reminded again that there is more to God's kingdom than right where we live and right where we worship. We serve a big God, and he's at work in a lot of places. Praise his holy name. I saw one of my friends, longtime acquaintances, who is a Carolyn uh, Brotherham. Gene Fry is your cousin. Would that be right? Uncle. Thank you. I'll get it right one of these days. Anyway, I've known Gene. Uh, he's been, I knew Gene before I knew Carolyn in, in, in years gone by uh, on the Kansas City District here. This, this whole family of Nazarene churches on the Kansas City District, which is 100 churches now. And Gene was working at the, at the coffee bar. And I would kid it around. I said, hey, they got a cash bar out there at District Assembly. Well, it's for coffee and Coke, but, 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 but Gene, I walked up to get a cup of coffee, and Gene said, hey, pastor, I've been trying to get your attention. And I said to him, I said, Gene, look, buddy, I'm double ARP eligible, and I don't have to pay attention if I don't want to. He kind of grinned. He said, yeah, I see how you are. But, but you know, aren't we kind of that way? I mean, I mean. Don't we just really want to do what we want to do? We don't want to be bossed around. We don't want to be told what to do. We want to have it our way or the highway. I mean, we see that in toddlers who throw these tremendous temper tantrums because they're not getting their way. And they can be pretty bullheaded. They want to have their way. They want to do what they want when they want, with whomever they want. We see it in toddlers. We see it in teenagers, don't we? Don't we see it in teens who says to us, hey, everybody else is doing it, why can't I? We see it in young people. Ten-year-old Timothy, a, a neighborhood friend of my son Ryan who recently moved into a, the, the Bonner Springs, Baser kind of area, uh, is kind of one of those kids that runs all around the neighborhood, and we don't think his parents ever know where he's at. But he latched on to Ryan and I and my granddaughter and as we were out for a walk a couple of weeks ago, and we, I kind of thought Timothy should be staying closer to home. I don't, he didn't have permission to be with us. And they don't know us from Sikkim. We could be the boogeyman, you know. So I said to Timothy, I said, Timothy, buddy, you're a sweet kid. You need to go back home or back around your house. I mean, you don't really know us, and you shouldn't be walking around with us. I know you'd be safe, but this is not a good practice. Then he said to me, I'm 10 years old, and I don't have to go home. <laughs> All right. We hear it from him. We hear employees say, in similar veins, <clears throat> I have seniority. It's not in my job description. And we hear the employer say, I'm the boss. And we hear husbands say, I'm the man of the house. And we hear the wives say, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. <laughs> or to your kids, I brought you into this world and I can take you out of it. Don't we shoot even pastors say it. Hey, I'm the pastor here. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, with whomever I want. And this is the way that it was in Israel about 1000 B.C. during the days of the judges. Judges were leaders that for the most part were raised up by God. Jephthah would be one who kind of assumed a role, but they were 12 
leaders who were called judges that were raised up at particular times for particular purposes, primarily to rescue God's people from the plight that they were in. And it was a vicious cycle. You see, when the judge was alive and they were following their leader, they would be pretty good troops. But when the judge died, they just did whatever they wanted to with whomever they wanted to, wherever they wanted to. In fact, Judges 21-25 sums up the whole period of judges like this. In those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their eyes. And you know, not, not much has changed. We're still that way in our humanity. We're still that way oftentimes as God's people. We don't want to be told what to do. We want to do what seems right to us. Judges has some head-scratching stories in it. Oh, Nelson. And this one that we're going to engage today is in Judges 19. And in my opinion, it is one of the most bizarre stories in all of Scripture. It's a mind-blower. And if there was ever a head-scratcher, it's this story in Judges 19. You, you would not let Parker watch this movie, Steve. If a movie was made based on Judges 19, you wouldn't let him watch it, and you shouldn't watch it either. But lo and behold, here it is. God says, look. Look at what happens to my people when they just take it upon themselves to do what seems right to them in their own eyes, when they decide for themselves that I am my boss and I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, wherever I want, with whomever I want. Now let me preface this story and put it in some context for us before we read it. The story takes place within about a five mile, about a five mile radius of Jerusalem. Ding, 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 ding. The holy city. Okay? Takes place within about a five mile radius of Jerusalem and the people in the story are Israelites. They're God's chosen people. There is, you know, it'd be a good segue for a priest, a rabbi, and a, and a, bishop here, but there's a Levite, and he's from the priestly tribe of Levi. The priests in Israel came from the tribe of Levi. There's a Levite. He doesn't have a name. None of these people are named here in this story, but we just know he's a Levite, and he's he may be a priest, he may not be a rabbi, we, we just don't know for sure, but he's, he's at least got this heritage. And there is his unnamed wife, who's called a concubine. Uh, that means that she is his property. Now she's not the first wife, because she doesn't have first wife rights. She may be second, third, fourth, or whatever, but she's his property. There's the concubine's father. There's his father-in-law. Likely he had several father-in-laws, and we don't know whether this, whether this father-in-law is in the line, but there's the father-in-law. There is an old man. All we know is he's an old man. Well, in their culture, an old man could be like Carl's age. You know, we think of an old man today being like really, 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 really old. There is a group of what the New International Version calls wicked men. Okay? 
Now, depending on which translation you're reading here in Judges 19, the NIV calls this group of men wicked. The New Revised Standard Version calls them perverse. The New American Standard Bible calls them worthless. The message, paraphrase, calls them a gang of local hell-raising dudes. And the Living Bible calls them sex perverts. So I kind of, uh, I kind of put this together, and, and, and this group of men are going to be called by me this morning a perverse, worthless gang of hell-raising sex perverts. You got the picture here? We got a Levite, his wife, who's not his first in line. We got an old man, we got the father-in-law, and we got this um, wicked, perverse, worthless gang of hell-raising sex perverts. All Israelites. They have these two things in common. They're God's chosen people doing what seems right to them whenever they want, with whomever they want, whatever they want. Darren Goodwin's going to come up and read our text this morning. Darren's not any of those people, (laughs) but Darren is a minister. And Darren, thank you for reading the Word of God this morning. I'm going to ask you if you'd please stand for this bizarre, perverse, disturbing, head-scratching story in Judges 19. Darren, you have the floor, brother. Thank you. Hear me okay? Now, in those days, Israel had no king. There was a man from the tribe of Levi living in a remote area of the hill country of Ephraim. One day he brought home a woman from Bethlehem in Judah to be his concubine. But she became angry with him and returned to her father's home in Bethlehem. After about four months, her husband set out for Bethlehem to speak personally to her and persuade her to come back. He took with him a servant and a pair of donkeys. And when he arrived at her father's house, her her father saw him and welcomed him. Her father urged him to stay a while, so he stayed three days, eating, drinking, and sleeping there. On the fourth day, the man was up early, ready to leave, but the woman's father said to his son-in-law, Have something to eat before you go. So the two men sat together and had something to eat and drink. Then the woman's father said, Please stay another night and enjoy yourself. The man got up to leave, but his father-in-law kept urging him to stay. So he finally gave in and stayed the night. On the morning of the fifth day, he was up early again, ready to leave. And again, the woman's father said, have something to eat. Then you can leave later this afternoon. So they had another day of feasting. Later, as the man, later as the man and, and his concubine And servant were preparing to leave. His father-in-law said, look, it's almost evening. Stay the night and enjoy yourself. Tomorrow you can get up early and be on your way. But this time the man was determined to leave. So he took his two saddled donkeys and his concubine and headed in the direction of Jebus. That is Jerusalem. It was late in the day when they neared Jebus. And the man's servant said to him, let's stop at this Jebusite town and spend the night there. No, his master said, we can't stay in this foreign town where there are no Israelites. Instead, we will go to Gebeah. Come on, let's try to get as far as Gebeah or Ramah, and we'll spend the night in one of those towns. So they went on. The sun was setting as they came to Gebeah, a town in the land of Benjamin. So they stopped there to spend the night, and they rested in the town square, but no one took them in for the night. That evening, an old man came home from his work in the fields. He was from the hill country of Ephraim, but he was living in Gebeah, where the people were from the tribe of Benjamin. When he saw the travelers sitting in the town square, he asked them where they were from and where they were going. 
He had been in Bethlehem in Judah, the man replied. We are on the way to a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim, which is my home. I traveled to Bethlehem, and now I'm returning home. But no one has taken us in for the night, even though we have everything we need. We have straw and feed for our donkeys and plenty of bread and wine for ourselves. You are welcome to stay with me, the old man said. I will give you anything you might need. But whatever you do, don't spend the night in the square. So he took them home with him and fed the donkeys. And after they washed their feet, they ate and drank together. While they were enjoying themselves, a crowd of troublemakers from the town surrounded the house. They began beating at the door and shouting to the old man, Bring out the man who is staying with you so that we can have sex with him. The old man stepped outside to talk to them. No, my brothers, don't do such an evil thing, for this man is a guest in my house. And such a thing would be shameful. Here, take my virgin daughter and this man's concubine. I will bring them out to you, and you can abuse them and do whatever you like. But don't do such a shameful thing to this man. But they wouldn't listen to him. So the Levite took hold of his concubine and pushed her out of the door. The men of the town abused her all night, taking turns raping her until morning. Finally, at dawn, they let her go. And at daybreak, the woman returned to the house where her husband was staying. She collapsed at the door of the house and lay there until it was light. When the husband opened the door to leave, there lay his concubine with her hands on the threshold. He said, get up, let's go. But there was no answer. So he put her body on his donkey and took her home. When he got home, he took a knife and cut his concubine's body into 12 pieces. Then he sent one piece to each tribe throughout all the territory of Israel. Everyone who saw it said, such a horrible crime has, been com- has not been committed in all the time since Israel left Egypt. Think about it. What are you going to do? Who's going to speak up? The word of the Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. Wow, what a disturbing word of the Lord that is. Thank you, Darren, for sharing that stinking story with us. Goodness gracious. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, with whomever I want. And when we as Christ followers in particular do that, there are serious consequences and somebody's going to get hurt. The only person in this story, as near as I can tell, who apparently didn't have a voice in the matter whatsoever is the virgin daughter. The wife is unfaithful in some way and she bails on the marriage and leaves her husband and goes back home. The husband apparently hasn't been treating his wife very well. Perhaps she wouldn't have left. And so he goes and reclaims his property. The old man, to his credit, finds him in the square there and at least he's hospitable. But the old man... Instead of doing what I think would be the right thing and taking a stand, just gives away his virgin daughter and the Levite's wife and says, here, take these two. Have your way with them. Men, when we treat women as property, we're going to be held accountable. Of course, then there's the worthless, troublemaking sex perverts out in the square there. Everyone in this story, except for the virgin daughter, as near as we can tell, is doing whatever they want, with whomever they want, whenever they want. Doing what seemed right 
in their own eyes. Is this just not unbelievable? Unbelievable that God's people, God's chosen people would act this way? And you know what? We're not going to engage chapters 20 and 21 in this sermon series, but if you want to see how it goes from bad to worse, you ought to read the rest of the story. As a result of the Levite taking his dead wife home and cutting her arms and legs off and sending them to the other tribes of Israel, what follows is war, civil war. And the rest of the story is just absolutely mind-boggling. The civil war that follows between the clans of Israel and the carnage that takes place there, the near extinction of a country. Robbing and polluting and warring on each other. And Judges Judges chapter 21, it just... It just tells the, it tells the story. In those days, Israel had no king. The last verse says, in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. If I had permission, and I don't, Dr. Dunn, if I had permission just to edit the book, I'd probably just take judges out of there. I just want to go from Joshua, strong and courageous in the promised land, to Ruth Kinsman, Redeemer. And just take judges out of there. Let's just delete that. Nobody should be reading that garbage anyway, right? Wrong. Amen. Because God has a word for us there. God has a word for us there. God wants every generation of people to know what happens when we decide to do what seems right to us. Instead of being obedient to what is right for us. When we decide that it's in our own best interest to do whatever we want, with whomever we want, whenever we want, the consequences are chaos, heartbreak, suffering, and people get hurt. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. And we deny the reality that we do have a king. We know his name to be Jesus. And Jesus came not only to save us, but to show us what God is like. That God is just, and God is righteous, and God is holy, and God is merciful, and God is grace-giving and patient, and desires none to perish. And God is sovereign, and Jesus is Lord. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and whether we recognize it or not, we do have a king, and we are answerable to him. Scripture says, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Whether you claim him as Lord or not, you're going to come to the sober truth that Jesus is King. Let me ask you this morning. Let me ask you this morning, who's your King? Because he's either Lord of all of your life. Or he's not Lord of your life. You see, we, you, you, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't have it both ways. But yet we insist on doing whatever we want with whomever we want, whenever we want, wherever we want. And we summarily just dismiss the word of God. District Assembly this past week, Dr. J.K. Warwick, one of our general superintendents who's retiring, quoted from a book that he'd been reading wherein the author said, too many Christians have bought, too many Christians have bought in but not sold out. Too many Christians have said yes to Jesus for the salvation life insurance policy and they've opted out of the spirit-filled abundant life clauses. 
Jesus says in John 10, 10, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Or another translation, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. But too many Christians aren't there yet. Because they're not willing to go there yet. They still want to do whatever they want, with whomever they want, wherever they want. They're living at best, at best, a mediocre Christian life. Merely dabbling in the Christian life is what seems right to their eye. Well, I'll go to church this morning. Uh, I might tithe. Hmm. Maybe I'll serve. Maybe not. I'll just do what seems right at the time. At best, they're living a mediocre Christian life. Dabbling in Christianity. And if at any part or any time it makes them feel uncomfortable, well, I'm not comfortable talking to Jesus. I'm not comfortable praying. I'm not comfortable talking to people about Jesus. Or it's inconvenient. You know, I worked really hard on Saturday. I've got to take a rest. I don't want to go worship the creator of the universe. When it's uncomfortable or inconvenient or problematic for them, they just do what seems right in their eye. Doing whatever they want. Whenever they want. With whomever they want. Galatians 5, 17, the Apostle Paul writes, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. There is this constant battle where we want to do whatever we want with whomever we want, wherever we want, and that's the flesh raising up its self-controlling, ugly head saying, I want it my way or it's the highway, and there's the Spirit of God saying, you were bought with a price, pal. You were bought with a price, and you're not your own. And there's this war that's waging inside some Christians. There's no victory in that kind of living. There's no joy in that kind of living. There's no peace in that kind of living. There's no fulfillment. There's no life change from the inside out when we live life that way. The Apostle Paul wrestled with that very thing. He tells us about it in Romans chapter 7. Beginning in verse 15, he says, I don't really understand myself. For I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know... That what I'm doing is wrong. This shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I want to do what is wrong. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. And in verse 24, he comes to this pitiful conclusion. What a miserable person I am. And he asks the question, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? This conflict, this war that's going on inside the professed Christ follower that says, I want it my way, I want to have my way, I want to do what seems right to me, I, I'm, I'm my own boss. To the spirit who says, you're not your own, you were bought for a price. 
You're not free. You're not free to indulge in the sinful nature. Let me ask you this morning, church. Aren't you sick and tired of living like that? Seriously, aren't you sick and tired of that kind of conflict in your life? Where you come in here on Sunday morning and you put on this facade that all is good. And out there you're doing whatever you want, whenever you want, with whomever you want doing whatever seems right in your own eye, and God's holy word has no authority in your life. Who's your king? Aren't you tired of living life like that? Friends, I've got some great news for you this morning. You don't have to live like that. God's plan was never for you to live your Christian life like that. The remedy is the Spirit-filled, sanctified life. The Christian life is to be a sanctified life. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says it is God's will that you should be sanctified. Jesus is more than a heaven Insurance policy. He has come that you might have life and have it more abundantly here and now that you could be delivered from this war and conflict that is raging within you. That as the Apostle Paul observed, that you can be set free from this. And he asked the question, who's going to do this? What a wretched man I am. I'm miserable. Who's going to help me here? Sanctification is a complete filling of the Holy Spirit. It's complete filling of the Holy Spirit wherein your life is completely set apart for Him. God said it, I'm doing it, and that settles it. He's my king. God's will is for you to be sanctified. And he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that he will do it. God will sanctify you completely. The Apostle Paul writes, so I say... Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives that you won't be doing what your sinful nature desires. Let the Holy Spirit cleanse you. Let the Holy Spirit fill you through and through. The Apostle writes in 1 Thessalonians, May the Spirit sanctify you. Through and through, God himself is faithful and he will do it. This is not of your own works. This is not something you do. This is something you yield to. And the result is you'll be free to live a fully committed life for Jesus Christ. Where the Spirit wins out. And you're not struggling In yielding to sin, doing whatever you want, whenever you want, with whomever you want. You're free to live a fully committed life to God. In 1980, a young Rwanda preacher was told by his tribesmen to renounce Christ or they would kill him. In the night before he was martyred for his faith, he had left this note on his desk in his little hut of an office. And it reads, I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. 
The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, or back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I am finished and done with low living, sight walking, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed vision, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. My face is set. My gate is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions are few. My guide is reliable. My mission is clear. I won't give up, shut up, let up until I've stayed up, stored up, prayed up for the cause of Jesus Christ. I must go until he comes, give till I drop, preach till everyone knows, work till he stops me, and when he comes for his own, he will have no trouble recognizing me. My banner will have been clear. This is a sanctified man. This is a man who knows who his king is. Who's yours? If you're one person in here on Sunday and you're another and come Monday morning, let me be as candid and as bold and as, and, and, and as, and as truthful as I can be. Jesus is not your king. He's either Lord of all your life or he's not Lord of your life. The sanctified life is the spirit-filled life. Kindness, gentleness, self-control, patient, loving, sold out, consecrated. It's doing what Jesus would do through the empowering, dwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in you, Christ in you. And as a Christian, if you truly are one, you are not free to do whatever you want, whatever you want, with whomever you want. You were bought for a price. You are not your own. You're a disciple of Jesus Christ. And the Christian life, God's will for you is the sanctified life. Jesus is either your king or he's not. Would you please stand? Right now, here in this place, It's time for you to make a choice. It's time for you to enter into the sanctified life with Jesus as your Lord and Savior, as your King. Or you can walk right out those doors. But you've heard it. God's will is that you be sanctified. It breaks his heart to see you live in conflict that way. Age 32, I went to a revival service. I had been saved. I'd received Jesus into my heart as Lord and Savior, but I can tell you firsthand, I was not sanctified. I continued to do what seemed right in my eye. As a 
as a trooper, and I esteem and love troopers. That was my life. But that culture is difficult to live a Christian life in. And so I was one person at church, and I was another person out there. My attitude, my filthy mouth, my self-centeredness, I went to a revival. And I finally came to the point in this life when I said, God, don't you have something else for me? Is this all there is? The preacher, I don't remember who he was. He said, God is calling you to the sanctified life, to be entirely consecrated, to finally say yes in your Christian walk, that Jesus is Lord and receive Him through prayer, asking Him to so engulf and fill your heart and life with the Holy Spirit that you're yielding your family, you're yielding your sex life, you're yielding your friends, you're yielding your work, you're yielding your finances, you're yielding everything that might be problematic for you that's in conflict with God's Holy Spirit to yield all of that to Him and settle the matter. So right now, maybe you're where I was at. Let me tell you, That sanctification is a daily walk as well. Every day, the choices and the decisions we made calls us back to the day that we gave our life totally and completely to Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, and we're saying, yes, Lord, in this choice, in this decision, in this relationship, in this act, We're saying, yes, Lord, I'll I'll, I'll follow you. Though it may cost me, I'll follow you. I know you're with me. Aren't you tired of this? I'm, I'm inviting you to an altar of prayer this morning. Right now, the devil's saying, well, what will people think of you? Why? They'll know that you weren't a sold-out Christian. Satan has no authority here. This is God's house, and He is here, and the Holy Spirit is moving, and I am inviting you to an altar of prayer to settle the question. To, by faith, ask God to sanctify you wholly, to cleanse your heart, to cleanse your spirit, and to create in you that new heart he promised about in Ezekiel that he delivered in Christ through the Holy Spirit. The altars are open. And it would be my privilege to pray over you and for you as you come. And it would break my heart It would break God's if you deny his lordship in your life. Let's sing.